Now I'm recording. Okay. Hey, for those, Alessandra Urso just reminded me again to turn on the recording. Um, for those coming into the recording, again, you haven't missed anything. It just started. Uh, I want to start by showing you guys something. Um, Yoshi Onishi, uh, uh, just he got his DMA just a couple of years ago, right, Yoshi, I think? from us here at Columbia. Uh, he's in central Missouri right now. And uh, he got really bitten by this and did, um, actually I'll let, I'll let Yoshi tell you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, Yoshi, cause I'm gonna bring up the video oh, sure. that you made, okay? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm Yoshi Onishi, and uh, um, I graduated from Columbia in 2015. And um, um, actually, this year was well, this is my third year uh, here at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, uh, doing a postdoc. And uh, uh, one of uh, the jobs I have to do here is to uh, <laughs> to teach. Uh, uh, composition seminar and uh, because it's taking a format of online uh, lectures I really had to think about creative ways to um, how to to run this class and in fact I've been teaching open music uh, to students here and uh, so I've been attending uh, this uh, seminar um, from the beginning and uh, uh, when uh, Brad showed us the the, uh, these logistic equation and Lorentz attractors and uh, Henel map and things like that. I was very intrigued. At first, I I was like, okay, well, uh, that's that's interesting that you, you can do and all that. And then it occurred to me that maybe it's possible to implement these equations um, in the in the open music uh, for possible use of some kind of musical thing. And in fact, uh, the class was really um, um, at the really right timing because um, I myself have, have been teaching uh, to them the uh, loop mechanism on open music and some of the recursive or the iterative processes that uh, Brad was doing really resonated with me and I uh, so actually since uh, two or three days ago I've uh, actually been trying to translate so to say uh, these equations and um, into open music and see what happens. And uh, uh, the, the thing that Brad is showing is in fact one of the, uh, the, the it was the first result uh, of the logistic or the, the uh, uh, population equation, um, which I just uh, let it run the, the open music patch and then had it translate so that the vertical uh, is the, the uh, pitch and then the horizontal is the time. And so, um, I mean, you, you can run that, of course. Yeah, I'm going to run it. Yeah, yeah you've sure. done the, I think you've done the Hanon, but it hasn't been sonified yet, too. Um, if oh, people it, are, it has been, actually. Oh, really? Cool, cool, mm -hmm. cool. People, mm -hmm. if you're interested in this, just send Yoshi a message in the chat, and he can put you in touch with himself. And, uh, but anyhow, this is, this is the logistic map um, on, a, on a piano. Kind of fun. Brian Fernio, eat your heart out. <laughs> it's incredible. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna stop share. Yeah, I just wanted to like let you guys kind of get a, get a handle on that. So that, I mean, you can do a lot with this. I think there's a big unexplored territory here. So yeah. Oh, uh oh. Where's that from? Oh, hold on. You guys didn't hear that, did you? No. Yeah. Good. <laughs> it went on to the next video, which was some really terrible MIDI uh, oboe thing. <laughs> it wasn't yours, Yoshi. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> Bizarre. All right. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, Yoshi's, Yoshi's uh, really kind of gone after this with gangbusters. For those who don't know, open music is another sort of a graphical 
sort of programming interface. It's interesting because it lies on top of this language Lisp, which is kind of recursive by its very nature. Um, and uh, you can do some pretty powerful stuff with it. A lot of people use open music for doing kind of algorithmic composition intended for realization on real instruments, you know? And what was funny about that piano was the quarter tones. It really gave it a particular, I'm not sure. Well, you could go to Georg Haas's office and you could play it there, I think. <laughs> Anyhow. All righty, well, let's, uh, let's get down to this. Again, if anybody else has any comments or questions, uh, you know, um, and in fact, that's actually, the first thing I'll say is that uh, our guest tonight, um, uh, Doug Scott has made it known to me that he would really prefer if you have questions or such, you know, to just interrupt. I'll try and monitor the uh, the chat so you can raise your hand there and I'll see if I can find, you know, find people, uh, the participants in the chat. Um, and owner's going to be looking after it too. Uh, but he'd like, a, he, he wants to talk about his stuff and then, you know, just uh, whenever you've got some questions. And I encourage you to ask him questions, okay, because he's probably the person um, most familiar now with the RTC mix code. Um, you know, I, it's, it's out of my hands at this point. You know, I, I occasionally contribute something and then Doug tells me what's wrong with it. So, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I, I'll just give you a little bit of his history so you know who you're dealing with. Doug was actually my very first teaching assistant at Columbia University when I showed up in 1987. Um, Doug was a graduate student here then. And he, uh, he kind of, you know, was very interested in computer, in computer music. We had a Sun workstation at the time, a Sun 3280S. Remember that the S was important because it made it like really cool. Um, it was the only machine we had. Nobody had machines at home, you know, and we just like worked on it night and day. And we were using a language called CMix back then, which uh, we had written at Princeton when I was a grad student there. Paul Lansky did the main coding and myself and Dave Madol and Andy Miller and a few others contributed quite a bit. And Lars Graf did the Mincy language. Uh, in Doug, Doug got snatched away because of his talents. And he was given a job and helped set up the computer music operation at uh, University of North Texas in Denton, Texas. And if you're familiar with our world, that was a pretty big operation. They were quite an outpost. Larry, um, uh, oh, good Austin. Lord. Larry Austin, yeah, Austin. I was saying Larry Polanski. Yeah, Larry Austin was there, a few others. John Christopher Nelson was there. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a kind of a big player and Doug played a profound role in kind of setting that up. Then people at UC Santa Barbara got note of Doug and his talents. And he went out there and, and set up their computer music operation, <laughs> which is a pretty major thing right now. He was working with uh, Johanna Cuchera Moran and a few others. Um, and then industry got a hold of Doug. And um, was it after UCSB, was that when you went to work for SGI? Yep. Okay, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, SGI stands for Silicon Graphics Incorporated. Basically, most everything you do in Unity or in Pixar stuff or anything like that, um, you owe it to SGI because they came up with this thing called OpenGL, which is the graphics language that all of our contemporary computer graphics pretty much lies upon. So Doug got a job with SGI, stayed with them until they folded. <laughs> and then that's when you went to work for, um, was it a, a Danger? Let me, I'll give the tour of what, where I worked as part of my, my bio, my bio intro. So. Okay. Okay. Well, I just think it's kind of fun because he's had quite a, quite a life. Um, in the meantime, he's continued to write just wonderful and elegant pieces of music. And I've asked him of course, to play some of that and talk about it. Um, but uh, more importantly, he's also going to kind of uh, open up the hood and show you how he's doing some of his stuff. And some of the techniques are pretty advanced. You know, you've already seen, I think most of the, basic features of RTC mix. Um, but uh, Doug's going to show you how he uses it to kind of realize his algorithmic sort of compositions. And the one thing that's fun about Doug is that he and I like to argue a lot. <laughs> it's not, we used to have like big knockdown drag out fights in, in seminar about, you know, the best way to do something or yeah, not so much aesthetics. We pretty much agree on that, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it was fun. It still is. And um, yeah, he's definitely the person, you know, when, when there's questions I can't answer, I say, well, let's, let's write to Doug. And it's like this mystical figure in the sky. So with that, I'm going to turn it over and let Doug kind of uh, take you on his tour. All right. Welcome here, Doug. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. 
Well, give me credit for coming back and showing my face in front of all of you after after waffling around horribly with bad technology for a uh, for what for fifty minutes two weeks ago. <clears throat> but uh, hey, Doug. I, before we start, we got a question right off the bat. Um, oh. John Levy wants to know when were you at UNT? I was at uh, UNT uh, for just uh, one school year from uh, just before school started in 1989 uh, until summer of 1990. Sorry to interrupt, but you said you wanted to be interrupted. Okay. So. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. That's my, fine. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. One of my undergrad yes. professors did his bachelor's and his doctorate there, and I was just wondering if you were there the same years as them, but you weren't, so never mind. <laughs> ah, okay. My, my, my experience there was a little odd because uh, though I was running, uh, setting up all the technology, there were only a very few composers at UNT that were actually... Uh, interested in using that technology. So I interacted with those people, but with the rest of the music department, it was it was much more spare. So there are some people that I met, especially when I first got there, was introduced to everybody, but there are people that that were there that I never made friends with or really had much of a conversation with. I was kind of a I was really kind of an assistant to that particular department. And as you, as you will find out as you go out into the world, um, many, many, many music schools are heavily divided between people who believe in this kind of technology and music and those who don't. So Brad knows nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's changing. I mean, it's changing, you know, STEM stuff. You yeah. know, people push that now because there's money there. Sure. But, yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, Let's see. So I wanted to just give a sort of a do a bio of me so you can sort of have a sense of where I came from and how I ended up in this place being so involved in this stuff. So um, I'm born and raised in California, in Southern California, actually. Um, I've been interested in electronic music since I was uh, about 12 years old and I heard Switched On Bach. Um, it, it fascinated me. I listened to that album more times than I could possibly imagine. Um, when I got into high school, I actually built a series of synthesizers, um, analog synthesizers from scratch, from individual transistors and resistors and stuff like that. My father was an electrical, he was an electrochemist, so he had a lot of background in electronics. So we did projects for years. He taught me how to burn circuit, to actually make circuit boards with photo, photo developing and stuff. So I had a lot of fun with with uh, getting into the depth of developing analog synths when I was in high school. I started um, composing, including electronic stuff, when I was about 15. Um, I got a BA in music from UCLA, which is near where I grew up. And then I went to Indiana University, where I got an MM. And I should say that for both, um, when I was at UCLA, I did electronic music. When I went to Indiana University, I did none. Not well, I never even saw an electronic music studio when I was doing my master's at, at, uh, at Indiana University. And that was because I'd made a decision to use that time to develop myself as an instrumental and vocal uh, composer rather than electronic. Um, where I discovered digital music was my first week at Columbia because uh, I don't know how it is now, but when I started as a, as a doctoral student at Columbia, you were required to take a class in computer music. And I had said prophetically before I got to Columbia, I will never use a computer. <laughs> so um, my first day in my first class at Columbia in that same old studio in Prentice Hall that I don't know. You all been to that? I mean, do you all go into that? Is that just something you visit with, like, and like genuflect outside the door, or do people actually do anything in that? Oh room? no, no, no! It's it's very active now. Uh, well, it was before COVID, you know. But uh, yeah, uh, there's a yeah, there, we've right. got a lot of studios going, and a lot of things happen around there. But that particular room, that particular studio, I, I walked. That's in our there seminar room. I, yeah. There was a grad, okay. There was a grad student who was just he had just graduated the previous the, the previous summer. And he'd come back to visit some people he knew, and he played his doctoral dissertation 
which was a piece for piano and electronics. He just played the electronic part. And I had never heard anything remotely like it. It was all generated. It was all computer generated. And at that time, believe it or not, it was all generated using code written in assembly. For those of you who know, <laughs> know computers, there was no computer language written in a language that you could type in nicely as text. Anyway, amazing amount of work. And the piece was just the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. So I was instantly hooked. So I, I can date my, my decision to become an electronic, you know, a digital composer to that moment. Um, and I, my love affair with computers and with software also began um, during that same time. And that's why I work now professionally writing software rather than, rather than teaching music. Um, let's see, to sort, of, to sort of dovetail my story in with what Brad said. So I finished at Columbia. I, was, uh, I got myself a job at University of North Texas. I set up their studio. Um, I had a chance to actually teach the, te teach the professors there how to use um, uh, computer music languages. Then I, uh, uh, I took a year off, got married, moved around, and then uh, got a job at UC Santa Barbara, did the same thing there, set up their studio, set up their Next workstations back when the Next was popular. When that sort of fell apart, that's when we got the STI machines. It was my experience with the SGI machines that led me to correspond with a, a software engineer in the audio department at SGI. And one day he said, we're hiring, are you interested in a job? And at that exact time, we had decided we needed to leave Santa Barbara because of um, my wife had lost her job. In, she's a teacher. And so we moved up to the Bay Area and that's when I moved into industry. I worked at Silicon Graphics. When Silicon Graphics sort of fell apart, I went to a small company called Beatnik that created a uh, embedded, meaning a, a piece of software that's designed to run on a very small piece of equipment. In those days, that was actually a, a completely separate world than things that would run on bigger computers. Um, but I was still doing music software. Um, I went to Danger, which made the T-Mobile sidekick, for those of you who know about that. Um, again, continuing to do uh, you know, sort of music synthesis software and stuff like that, like I was interested in. Uh, and then after that, uh, oh yeah, and then Microsoft destroyed, bought and destroyed that company. So I jumped ship and, uh, well, I didn't jump ship. I was laid off, I was, I was laid off <laughs> and went to work for Apple. And I've been at Apple 11 years. Um, I spent most of that time doing something related to sound and music in the last uh, five years though, I have been the uh, architect for uh, the haptics software department. So all the stuff on iPhones and I on watches that taps and vibrates and all that, that's my, that's my code. So that's what I do now. Um, and like Brad said, I have continued composing. I did have a long chunk of time where I didn't do anything uh, and then got back, back into it back in about, 2013 and have been composing pretty steadily uh, since then. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna. Now that I've sort of done that part, I'm gonna try to slow down a bit so I don't like frantically fl flail, you know, screens around and stuff like that. Um, uh, right. So what I want to do next is talk a little bit about my the way I think about music. Then I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna do a side jump in and do a review of a few Mincy uh, things, which will help you understand or help you help, hopefully should help put into your mind a little bit clearer some of the things you can do with it. So when I show you some scores, it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay. So let's see, uh, I want to go here and then I want to share that. Let's see. Uh, okay, sure. All right. Um, how is the text size on that for everybody? Is that readable? 
Uh, a little small for me, but it looks like it's okay for everybody else, right? Well, Anybody uh, shout out if you're not seeing it very well, okay? I, I couldn't figure out how to make it larger without the uh, without it going onto the you know pages that I didn't want to. Right, so, Doug. I think it's fine. If not, you know, I can zoom in on it or something. And it looks like everybody else is you know. All right. Seeing it so now there. I'm in a now I'm in a place where I can no longer see the chat bar. So if there is stuff, Brad, you'll just you'll just interrupt. Okay. All right. Um, so I wrote this up a couple of years ago for another talk I gave. Um, I just wanted to talk about sort of the things that I think about when I compose with RTC Mix. So my biases, the things that I'm interested in, the ways I like to go. First of all, one of my big things is uh, using natural sounds um, as my source material. Um, I've produced a whole set of pieces where I pick a one particular uh, kind of source material, like the sound of, uh, of somebody, uh, like sounds of glass being knocked together or somebody rubbing the rim of a glass. And I, I build a whole piece out of that. Um, I'm interested in these because, as I said here, first of all, there's an infinite number of these. You can record anything, and everything is, in a way, unique. And they're, of course, interesting and full of tiny little details that are really hard to create synthetically. I like layering stuff. Um, I believe that repeating anything literally is death. <laughs> and um, computers are unfortunately really good at doing that, so I don't believe in that. And that actually will um, uh, should be pretty obvious by a lot of the stuff that I do with uh, um, what I talk about a little later here with this constrained randomness. I like contrast. I like I'm very very into placing sounds in simulated room environments. Almost every piece I have has a signature feel or I don't know what you want to call it. I mean, it has a signature sort of feel of being inside a large or small or medium room. Um, I'm into uh, constrained randomness. Um, and I also like to try to limit the tools I use in any one piece so that I don't sort of lose my, my, lose my way. Um, I, I find that computer music has so many possibilities that that I will I will be paralyzed if I don't say okay this piece is going to do just this thing, or or I explore some small aspect of something. The uh, I know you've done a sort of a review of the kind of instruments that are available in RTC Mix. These are sort of the categories of things that I use a lot. I I, I do a lot of very old fashioned electronic music techniques. I transpose things. Um, there's two good programs that I use for that. I also am really into time dilation and compression. Do, does everybody, have you talked about that concept, Brad? Not too much. I mean, basically we've been doing, concentrating on synthesis instruments, you know, uh, primarily it. because of the algorithmic approach that we're taking. Got it. Okay, so time dilation and compression means you're taking, for those who haven't done stuff with, you know, complicated DSP, uh, hardware and stuff like that is the ability to take an arbitrary sound and have it progress over time at some vastly different rate than it was originally, uh, that it originally happened. For example, you might take the sound of somebody clapping and stretch that clap so that it takes 10 seconds or 50 seconds or five minutes. Um, and there are interesting pieces of software to, to do this. Then I have my, my room simulation and sound placement tools that I wrote, uh, some good old fashioned mixing tools, um, and then a, a special tool that I wrote a couple of years ago, which you'll see in virtually every score that I've written in the last couple of years called Chain, which um, I think I'll wait and talk about that when, it, when I have an example of it. Um, basically, it's a way of saying I want to filter something, but I also want to uh, uh, delay it. And by the way, I'd also like to dot, dot, dot. And you, so you want to stick a bunch of things together. And um, this is a really cool way to basically create a, a, a monster multi-instrument without having to um, do anything fancy other than just write a little score, uh, some stuff in your score. Okay. Um, 
Now, this is more sort of the way I, uh, the sort of two big areas of the, about the way I think when I try to create pieces. I have two sort of big categories of electronic music um, or, or use of algorithms in music. I, I'm tr I, I was trying to sort of think about what, I, I listened to your last, the, the classes that you've had with Brad so far um, this semester and sort of wanted to fit this in. So in terms of my use of algorithms in my music, what do I do with it? So the first is I create something that I call mid-level musical content. Um, and by this, I mean um, an idea in a piece that is, well, I, I wrote it here. It's, it's larger than some single event, but, but is smaller than a phrase. So what would that be like? Um, I guess you could call it a gesture. I mean, it's probably called that I mean, when you're doing musical analysis, it's called that even if you're doing that for, you know, traditional musical pieces. But um, I use algorithms to generate chunks of material that I then uh, figure out later how I want to actually compose those together into a, a larger piece. And that will be clear with a couple of the pieces I'm going to play, which I'll, I'll actually play them for you in um, Logic. So you can actually see all the individual pieces that are the chunks of stuff that I put together. Hey, hey Doug. Doug. Yeah. Um, something about this. Uh, this is a, actually I answered it for you in the chat, <laughs> but I should probably give you a chance to answer it. Uh, sure. Alessandra Urso was wondering why don't you just use uh, digital audio workstations for doing your time dilation? Why why use RTC mix? Um, my general rule is to try to create uh, as much of my musical piece within a single software world as I can. Um, I, I, I think that, I, that, that the kind of nature of that will become clear when I start showing you what my pieces look like and what the scores from my pieces look like. But um, other, than, um, other than Logic, which I use for as kind of a final mix down, I try to do all of my synthesis and processing within RTC mix. The reason for that is that I build into, that I build all of the processing into my algorithms. And so to separate out any one part of that into a separate system, I wouldn't get, it, it wouldn't be the same effect, right? I mean, I might have 16 things that are all combined together that have been time stretched and then they've been filtered and then they're put into a room simulator and that's all varying algorithmically, you know, 100 times a second. There's no way to tell the other system that you want it to do all that stuff for you. So I just stick completely within my, my world of tools. And if I can't do something with a tool, I just write one that will do it for me. Right. I was also saying that RTC Mix offers you direct access to some of the FFT parameters that you can't get at with a typical DAW. Sort of oh, you mean for, the, mean for the resynthesis stuff? Right, right. Or for oh, yeah. Vogue or something like that. You know, you can yeah. directly affect the type of the windows and the window size and things. Well, not only that, I added a system into the phase vocoder where you can filter your FFT bins before they're resynthesized. So you can do all kinds of really cool transformations that are not part of a normal time dilation system. So. Weirdo. Yeah. Um, then the other half of what I'm doing that I'll show you some scores, this is what I've been doing sort of in the last three, three or four years is, is, again, I'm just trying to come up with terms for these. I call these pseudo human musical structures. And by that, I mean, I'm trying to generate algorithms that produce music that, that sounds due to its texture and structure and harmony that it was generated, that it might've been generated by a, a human writing out instrumental music as opposed to a computer doing it. And I actually got involved in this through a very small project that I said, hey, I think I'll try to do X, Y, and Z. And when I did it, I, it was so fantastically successful at doing what I wanted that I, uh, that it became a whole genre for me of, of, of working with, uh, working with algorithms. that okay uh let's see okay now i wanted to change uh gears entirely again and um talk about a couple of uh specific rtc mix parser features 
that I make huge use out of and which uh, I think will be incredibly useful to you. One of which is you've, you've worked with a bit and the other one, I don't know, I guess, I don't know, have you talked about include at all, Brad? Not yet. Um, before you jump into it, though, I have another question from the audience. Uh, oh, yes. Right. Uh, uh, John, John Levy, John's Levy. I like that. Uh, the gestures you're talking about a minute ago, uh -huh. would calling these motifs be accurate? Um, depends upon how, what motif means to you. To me, a motif implies that it is a sort of a recognized building block of the piece, like, um, look, that motif, you know, comes in here and it comes in here. I mean, to me, the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, the, the dot, 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 dash is a motif, but whether it's a, it is also a gesture, but it is a motif that is used to build a piece and a gesture may just be something that shows up and has no, doesn't necessarily have any structural significance. Um, I think um, I think that what I'm my gestures are a little broader, right? Like um, if you had a piece that opened with a, uh, I'm just off the top of my head with a harp, uh, with a harp glissando, okay? That's a gesture. It it's going to produce a certain effect, but there may not be another harp glissando in your entire piece, and you wouldn't say the harp glissando is a important motif in the structure of this piece. So. That's that's sort of uh, that's sort of my to me it's a little more a little broader than that. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Anything on, else? On to include. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I haven't I covered that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So for that, um, let's see. Okay. This was the interesting part is how to press. Okay, I know what I want to do here. Let's do this. So share. Okay, blank window. That's how we like to start. All right. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of a score here. Let's see. This is the where it gets slightly interesting. All right, so here is a very, very simple score like um, you might have already had as an example. Um, what we have at the top of the score is information about the sample rate, the channel count, and the buffer size for your setting up of the system. Now, actually, this would only be something you would deal with if you were running the system in standalone, because if you're running this as part of an embedded world, this stuff is all set up for you. But um, I guess I should state that, that my world of musical composition using RTC Mix is a standalone world only. I, I am not running um, RTC Mix inside another audio system. So in that case, this information here is required because this is what tells my my audio converters and all that, what mode, I'm, what mode I'm running them in. And I can actually configure it to run at any sample rate and any reasonable channel count and so forth. Um, I should jump in here and say, if you are using scores um, in Max MSP or PD or something like that, sometimes you'll see these lines. Um, they're basically just ignored in those embedded contexts. So. Right. If you see here, it, what I'm using here is RTC McShell, which I know has been mentioned. If you'll notice that this line is grayed out, this is a sort of just a helpful piece of information that uh, John Gibson put in here to say that this line is going to be ignored. But it doesn't matter from the point of view of showing it to you. If I were to paste this into a, uh, a score and then run it with RTC mix from the command line, it would pay attention to this. So this score uh... plays that sound. <laughs> um, using this sample rate and this channel count and this buffer size. So imagine though that you had a uh, hundred of these score files. Each one had this information at the top of it, setting up you know, what your sample rate was and so forth. And then uh, you took those hundred sound files, those hundred score files and you went to another computer and found that that computer would only run at 
uh, at 96,000 sa uh, samples a second, 96K. You'd have to go in, in order to play all those files, you'd have to go in and change this line on every single score file you had. So we have a way to fix that. And that is if we, let's see. We can create a little file that looks like this. That's all it has in it. And if you take that and save it out as some name, um, then I'll show you what you can do. OK, so this particular file is called audio underbar setup dot include. There's a clue there, OK? If I take that, put it into a separate file, and then I do this. So you see what I've done here? All I've done is said include and then the name of that file. Notice that all those lines that I had uh, up at the top are gone. Uh... It still plays. Now, if I took 100 scores, all of which said include audio setup dot include, and uh, brought them to a machine that ran at 96K, I would have to change one file and only one file in order to make every single one of those scores compatible with that new machine. That's just the simplest possible reason why that might be useful. Uh, it saves time. The other thing that you can do with it is if you have some cool piece of code that you've re written that you want to use over and over again in multiple scores, rather than having to like copy paste that into all your scores, you can stick it into an include and then just include that in. And it's just as if that code was pasted into this score. And once again, if you found you have a bug in that original bit of stuff that you copy pasted, you can fix it in one place and not have to go into your 100 scores that you copy pasted and fix it. So it's that simple. This file here, the only rule is, is that your program has to be able to know where that is. In this case, it's in the same directory as I'm running this in, so it doesn't have to have a path on it. You'll see in some other scores I'm going to show you later that I have a full path pointing to this in order to uh, make absolutely sure that uh, um, the, the thing can see it. All right, any questions about including chunks of stuff from one score to another? And this works, by the way, in Max MSP scores too. It's just you have to make sure that the environment knows where it, the full path to something that you want to include. There's ways of getting that information within Max MSP if you just put it in the same directory as your Max patch. I figure that would probably work. All right, next, I want to revisit uh, functions. This was the make delay thing I did last time. That was an example of an RTC mix function. Right. So we'll start with, again, just a very simple score, no functions, nothing. The only thing it does have is has the include that we just used. And what does this do? It just opens a conga. It's, it sets input, outskip, duration, and amplitude, all of which Brad talked to you about. And then it uses mix. Brad says you have not come across mix before. Mix is pretty much the simplest processing, in other words, not a synthesis. It's pretty much the simplest processing instrument there is. All it does is reads its input and writes it to its output with starting at whatever point you want in the file, writing whatever point you want in your output stream for however long you want with a gain you want. And then these two basically tell you about channel assignments. So it's basically saying channel zero goes to slot zero, which is output channel zero. Channel one goes to output slot one. If I reverse these two like this, it reverses the channel. Did you hear it come from the opposite side? OK. All right. Mix is very straightforward. That's why I picked it for this. All right. Now we're going to make, we're going to go on to next one. All right. So let's say we want to use, uh, we want to do multiple mixes. 
The simplest possible way to do that would be to just take your out skip and then add hard coded out skips to each one. So you can see each one moves a little bit later. All right. This is my magical screen keeps changing. <laughs> All right. Now here we are doing it simply by using a variable where we're multiplying the variable each time. Same result. Getting a little more complicated each time. Slowly. All right. But now it starts to get very complicated if you want to use this pattern over and over again in different ways. So for example, now you start having to keep track of, oh, let's see, I want another set. So my out skip needs to go up and my offset, I need to change it here and here. This works, but. Oh, by the way, as you can see, I put it into a, a big loop. This, uh, this while, I think Brad did four loops. Uh, while is a little simple. Did you, you did while the very first time. Good. Yeah, okay, while, while to me is intuitive when you really only have one thing that you care about looping for. In my case, I want to just make sure that I don't loop past the point where my out skip, which is the skip into the output stream that I want the data to happen. I just don't want that to happen for any more than five seconds. If I change this to something small, I just get that and so forth. If I make it large, uh, I don't want to bother, but it would just play it for longer. All right. But uh, let's see. All right. So let's create a function to do the work for us. All right. So here we have a function which just calls the mix instrument. Notice this looks very similar. It's what we saw in the previous example. What's the difference? We wrapped it in a function, which Brad talked about. When you declare a function, you indicate what kind of variable it's going to return. You name it, and then you and then these are your arguments, which say what each thing that you're going to be passing to that function, passing meaning, putting between the parentheses when you call it. In this case. Um, one of the nice things is that a lot of the, let's imagine I don't really care about in skip, I don't care about duration, I don't care about amp, all of those are things that I know I want to have the same for every single call. So notice that all I needed to set was the start time. If you knew you needed more information, you just pat, you can just add arguments to this, it's that simple. But the point is, is that a lot of times these instruments have a lot more complexity to them in terms of what you have to tell them than you will ever care about. So if you wrap one of those in a function, you can then get it so that you never have to enter that information in again. You can just, I could just use the mimix function to produce 10,000 notes and everything else would be taken care of, including the durations and the gain and all that. So that's one of the simple uses of a function. Again, it's to save time. It reduces the typing if you can turn this down into that. Hey, Doug. Yeah. You might want to explain what that jur equals capital jur ah, sort of thing sure. is too. Okay. Um, when you are doing processing of input files in RTC Mix, in other words, you are set up to read, you want to read from a, a sound file that you have on your computer or read from a microphone or something like that and you want to take that stream of audio and process it using the one of one or more of the multitude of uh, signal processing instruments that that uh, cmix has uh, what you do is you specify what you want to be, have your input be which is what I did up here but nobody asked me any questions about that <laughs> Um, and then there's a set of utility functions, which you can call, which will t give you information about whatever the last one of these that you opened is. One of the legacy features of, R of RTC Mix is that it can only open one input file at a time. 
But it doesn't matter because what you do is you just open whichever file you want for whatever the next command is in your RTC mix script. And then if you want to open a different file for the next command after that, you just put in another RT input call. And these things happen very, very fast. So some of my files will open hundreds of RT, of RT uh, sorry, hundreds of audio files. And all I do is just keep switching between them. And every time you switch, this function will return the duration of this file in seconds. I so, should also point out that this will also this is also true for Max MSP and PD buffers. It treats them the same as a sound file in this case. All right, that's right. You so you do have the that's right. You have an RT input that turns a, a sound file into a buffer, right? Yes. yes. All right. Uh, all right. So now we're going to get to the. So this is a, a something which lets you reduce how much information you have to put in your score. You do the work once. I'm all about saving time because I want to get on to writing music and I don't want a lot of extra variables bogging me down if I don't have any need for them. Okay. All right. So here's my final more complicated score, sorry, uh, instrument, which takes an out skip, a total duration that I want this instrument to run and in this case, the number of times it repeats that sound. Uh, so let me just play it for you so you can see. What I've done is I've set it up to start here for one second and repeat seven times. And then I've said start two seconds later for a very short amount of time, but repeat 17 times. So the again the idea is that you do your work once so once you've written this you could then create an entire piece by just varying these and adding this line in if if you came to me and said well that's great but i do want to be able to change the volume then you just say well in this case i need a volume so you just go here and you just say Uh, and then you just would go here and delete this. Actually, you have to do one more thing and I'll show you. Notice that uh, I changed, oops, sorry. Well, that would be interesting too. Uh, have you ever talked about error error reporting in, in RTC mix, Brad? Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, did we do print on? I can't remember, maybe we did. Well, I'm not talking even about print. Well, okay, print on, but you'll get errors even if you don't have print on. So, so what have I done here? I've added another argument here, but guess what? I forgot to add it here, right? So what's gonna happen? You don't hear anything. Notice that, can you see that tiny little thing? I'll read it to you. It's very small. It says repeat mix, which is the name of my function. Arg amp not provided, defaulting to zero. So that means that I called this, but forgot to add that argument into my call. And so it's just gonna set it to zero, which it figured is the best value it could guess. I fixed that by just going in here. Oops. So there, now it's gonna play the first one at So you see, again, you can just, you just adjust your functions till they do what you need them to do and don't, don't have them expose anything else that you don't care about. Now, is there anything unusual inside here? Uh, oh, okay, a couple more things uh, about functions. Um, notice that these are uh, declared in a way that you've never seen done in any of the scores that Brad has showed you. And there's a special reason for this. Um, I won't go into the details, but these are variables. Um, you, these are variables like this and this and this, which I only want to be visible between these two curly braces here. I don't want the rest of the score to know anything about any of those variables. 
The way to do that is to declare them like this at the top of your function. That says this inskit variable will not be seen here, for example. If I were to try to do print inskit, right? Okay, the print command literally just, it just prints the value of whatever you give it, assuming it exists. But if I try that, You see this, this line right here, which is very tiny, and I don't know how to make it bigger, sorry, says parser error, in skip is not declared, and it gives a line number. So that shows us that these things here are local to this um, function. Now, why would you care? Well, I had some scores that I created that absolutely would not work, and I spent hours and hours and hours trying to figure out why and it turned out that something was being set inside a function and the code the mincy was saying oh i know that variable it was out it was over here and it was resetting these these variables to other values so this is just a a good way to prevent anything that you're doing inside a function from being um, exposed outside so what else do I do in here? I figure out how much forward in the output file I need to skip each time if I want to do some number of repeats. So that's just a little math to chop up the time into little bits. Are you typing, Brad? <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, I was answering a quick question in the chat. Oh. Uh, so go ahead, sorry. Okay, sure, no problem. I just thought, I just... okay, so all this is doing is saying for the number of repeats that I, that I ask for, Mix the input and the output, and then we skip forward based upon this calculation, which is dividing my total duration by the number of repeats. So that's, um, and as I think Brad may have said, uh, for reasons that I won't go into, every function needs to return something, even if you don't use it, but quite often it could, it could be quite a useful thing. Um, one of the things that I typically use my return for is, so this thing says, I'm going to start it at out skip such and so, and I'm going to play for this duration. Um, what I might want to know is, so when did this end? So if I were to go here and say, out skip plus total duration, I think probably there's another going to be another plus in there because um, the last one of these is actually going to play a little bit past the end of that. I think it might need to be like this. This is no longer a dummy. This is now return point at which we ended. Why would that be useful? What if you wanted to put these things back to back? just by having this line, how would you know where the next one needed to go? So what you can do is you can say end equals repeat mix. Uh, and then repeat mix end. Oh, that didn't work quite right. Okay, never mind. <laughs> hey, Doug, uh, yeah. just want to point out, we're about halfway through the class. So I want to make sure to leave time for you to talk about your music. Okay. Play some of that stuff. Okay. Okay, good. I think that's, that's the end of my review of what we, of what happens in, uh, in functions and stuff like that. Thanks. That's a, that's a good uh, cutting off point for that. All right. Uh, da, da, da. All right. Oh, okay. So uh, that's fine. What I wanted to do before I actually show you some scores is I saw that you talked um, last week about fractals. Um, I, fractals is one of the, I didn't put it in my list of things, but I'm, I am very interested in fractals and doing things that are um, musical with fractals. So I'm going to start off by playing you something. It's about a minute or two long, and then I'll show you the score after you hear it. Oh, you're looking at the other thing. Let's, uh, let's, well, here, let's just let you hear it first.
Um, oh, interesting. I must not have tried to play this one before. Okay, so what was that? That, so one of the ways that I think about fractals is as self-similar patterns. So the, the thing that Brad talked about that is closest to that is whatever that thing at the Koch curve, right? Uh, where, the snowflake curve, yeah. Oh, uh, right. So, uh, where you have an initial shape and then within each segment of that shape you repeat the original shape in its entirety you know on and on and on so in this score uh let's just talk through it so all of this stuff is just setting up um my audio uh this is about the depth of recursion so uh fractals are typically generated by recursive processes where you're taking something and then doing it to something smaller and then to something smaller and fleas have fleas and then the fleas fleas have fleas and and so forth what i've done here uh is used a min c feature which is that if you simply name a variable and then put an equals and then a curly brace and then a list of things separated by commas you've just generated an array of things. So what I've generated here is an array of paths to sound files. And these actually come from the files that are loaded with GarageBand, if you have that on your computer. They make great things to, they make great raw material for RTC mix pieces. Now, this right here, is the visibility okay when it's highlighted? Okay, that right here is the equivalent of that snowflake in its initial form. Okay, the snowflake is line segments producing a triangle. What this is, is three attack points in time. So we have one at time zero, one at, if it, for anybody who knows about golden mean, what the next one is at the golden mean between zero and one, and the last one is at one. So imagine that is your original curve. What this function does is it creates a score, it creates a, let me see, how do I say that? It creates a set of RTC mix commands where the first thing it does is just, um, is just do a um do this pattern over whatever my the entire duration was that i asked for so if in this case you'll notice down here that i said run this for 30 seconds so the first thing it's going to do is produce this pattern over 30 seconds so you're going to get a, a an event at zero you're going to get an event at 30 and you're going to get an event at the golden mean of between 0 and 30. Now what happens in here is that we um, change which file we open of these depending upon the depth. So as we recurse down, we um, change the pitch so that it gets higher and higher. And actually, I can tell you that I really like 
stacked fourths. So each one of these files is a, um, a perfect fourth above the other. Um, yeah, we hadn't covered this just to point out that instrument he's using. RTC mix instruments are generally in capital letters. Um, that one, trans three, is one that Doug wrote. It's a pitch shifter. So it'll take a, an existing file and shift it up or down by an arbitrary amount. Right. And how did I calculate that? I calculated that by uh, saying it's going to be, uh, actually, it looks like it's by steps. Can't remember. <laughs> uh, it generates a different transposition for each level of depth that you that you go. I think that one of the ways I could show this would be if I set the depth to one. Now you would have to wait thirty times 0.619 seconds till you hear the next the next note. Um, if I if I set the depth to two, you get two notes starting at the beginning. But what's going to happen is is that uh, so okay so. Remember that this thing divides up your time world into two segments, right? Between 0 and 0 0.61 and between 0 0.61 and 1. So when you recurse, it then fits 0 0.61 and 1 between the original 0 and 0 0.61 and the 0 0.61 and the 1. So now you've, you've mapped that same pattern onto the two segments that you originally had. When you recurse again, it does the same thing. It goes into each one of those segments and sticks that same pattern over and over again. So let's do it at about a uh, depth of about four. And I think maybe that will start to be clear. you hear the highest pitch most often. And they get faster because in the second half, you're fitting all of those between 0.619 and, and 1 recursively. So the, the texture gets denser and denser as you get towards the end because the first half is stretched between 0 and 0.619 and the second half is compressed. So just one more time, I'll play the beginning of that with the original depth. So that's an example of something that I've done. <laughs> so all, all those uh, all those sounds were basically piano sounds, even the little belly things, right? Everything they were just shifted way up high, right? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Um, now we're going to do a. Okay, so that's an example of something I did with fractals. I had another one, but um, seeing how everything takes longer than I expect, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to something completely different. Hey, Doug, got a question from yeah. Jean. Uh, what happens if you raise the depth even more? Whoa. <laughs> I believe the system will handle that. Let's see. I'm going to set it. I'm not letting you see this because I'm doing it in a separate window. I'm going to try setting it to 16. Uh, too many nested function calls. Uh, let me try 14. This is just a limit of the parser, which could be fixed, but let's see. Nope, I think I set it to 12 because that's as many levels of recursion as we allow. Remember that Brad was talking last week about how you need to set a depth so that it doesn't go in infinitely deep? This is something I put in to prevent that. If, if it gets below a depth of 12, it just kicks out and 
and uh, and throws an exception so your code just doesn't doesn't run. Uh, Lauren, did you have your hand up? I wasn't sure. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, all right, so I'm going to give a brief introduction to this piece before I talk about it because it might make it a little easier to understand why I did what I did here. So I have, since 2013, I've been part of a online worldwide music creating group called Disquiet Junto. If you're interested, I'll type the name of it in later, or you can actually, if you go to my, uh, to my website, which is the link that Brad posted for me on your page. It will take you to my SoundCloud site and then it'll talk about Disquiet Junto. Um, we do projects um, weekly. People opt in and out as they have time. And one of the projects was imagine that Buckminster Fuller was a composer. What would his music sound like? All right. So maybe I should just play a little of it first. of Buckminster Fuller, I think of geodesic domes. And when I think of geodesic domes, I think of numbers like 12 and 6 and things like that. So when I thought about this piece, I thought, well, okay, Bucky would probably write a piece that was all about numbers that he loved. So this piece is all built out of things involving 6 and 12. All right. So let's so this is going to be this is going to be kind of a deep dive. So just uh, hold on to your hats and don't worry about how much you understand. I for me it's better to probably just sort of show you what you can do and then we can pick it apart later. This will be one of the pieces that I that Brad will have uh that I'll give Brad to if he hasn't already to post him post so that you can go and look at it at your leisure and this will play um, this should play through your um, your systems. There is a problem with the synchronization of notes when you try to play it through a, an embedded system, but at least you can get a, a sense of what's going on. Okay, here we go. Um, I use a lot of different instruments in here. This is special code for uh, a standalone system, which makes sure that all those instruments are loaded in. Um, Remember I said I like to use room simulation. So this stuff sets up, uh, sets up part of my room. So does this. This is basically setting up the size of the room and some other things that are related to that room, like how much reverb it has and how much the walls absorb and the height of the room. This stuff is part of the setting up of the room. Then what do we have? We have some functions. Uh, a function comes out of a need for me. So I said, I need to be able to read values out of a list and know whether I've already read a value and not read it another time. So if I had a list that was like one, two, three, four, five, and I wanted to read that and I read it randomly and I got the five out, the next time I read it randomly, I don't want to read the five again. I want to read the one, two, three, or four, and so forth and so forth, so that I end up using up all the values in it before I go on and reset it and start reading them again. Why would I want this? Well, when you're doing random numbers, I, I want one of my constrained randoms is it's random, but it doesn't repeat. 
So what I'm doing is I'm generating a series of notes in this case, which are randomly picked, but the one part of the randomness that I don't do is I don't allow anything to repeat. Does that make sense a little bit? So what this thing does is it says, choose something out of this array and then clear that spot so that I never choose it again. So that when I go back the next time, it will pick some other note out of it. All right. Then we have a, another instrument, and this is where things really start getting into my territory. This is what I call a meta instrument. So this is an instrument that looks from the outside like a RTC mix instrument. It has an out skip, a duration, a pitch, what I call intensity, and then it has some extra things which allow me to place this in a virtual room. Um, What's happening in here is this uses a thing called a, um, a car plus strong strum algorithm, which Brad, you touched on ever so briefly. All of the kind of twangy sounds you heard in the piece are being generated using that instrument. But I also run a low pass filter on it. And then I put it into my room simulator. So this is an example of that thing I was telling you about where I chain a bunch of instruments together so that they all happen at once. And that's how this special um, RTC mix instrument works. I, um, I'm not going to go into how this actually functions right now, but just understand that these instruments are basically stuck output to input, output to input, and they run as a unit. So I can treat this thing generates a filtered strum that gets put into a room simulation. Okay. This is just what it says. All right, here we go. Uh, so again, sixes and twelves. So th this piece alternates between two hexachords. So hexachord in this case is the C hexachord minus the B, so C, C, D, E, F, G, F, sorry, C, D, E, F, G, A, and the F sharp hexachord, which is the other six notes. Um, the other thing is that the number of measures in each subsection of the piece alternate, because it alternates between the C and the F sharp, it alternates in groups. So the first time you, the first thing you hear is eight bars of C followed by four bars of F sharp. Notice it sums to 12. Next time you get seven bars of C followed by five bars of F sharp and so forth that until they swap and then they start moving in the other direction. And they actually go farther in the other direction than they, than they were in originally. And then what's gonna happen is this, measure counts is going to reset and start back over here. So it's going to, uh, for each section, the relative emphasis of the C and the F sharp is going to gradually change. This just sets up my notes that I'm using. This is the thing that I pass, that this is the thing that uses, that I use with that choose and clear. So I never pick notes more than once. Okay, but we're not done yet. We're still, we still got to figure out like rhythms. Okay, so the piece is actually in 12-8. It doesn't sound like it because of some things I did, but it's actually strict 12, 12 eighth notes per bar. The beats are grouped into three groups, three beats, four beats, and five beats. And in each case, the first eighth is always a rest. The second one is accented, and then the last ones are not. Uh, yeah. Quick question uh, from Anthony Dean. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to know your, your line count index equals zero. Uh, does that mean the function repeats infinitely? Let's see how that's used. Okay, count underscore index. Yeah. Uh, no, you'll notice that uh, what happens is when the measure, which is incrementing here, hits uh, so count index, I'm sorry, count index is increasing, oh, uh, measure counts is this. 
And what happens is, is that it's, we start off looking at measure counts sub count index, which is the beginning of it. And then um, when we hit the number of measures in this section, reset and switch hexachords. So count index then is reset here. You'll notice that we add one to it and then we modulo it with the length of the original array. So basically we walk to the end of that array of measure counts and then we start back at the beginning. And that's how you get that three, four, five pattern repeating over and over and over again. So essentially it does go over and over and over again. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but that's, that's, there are other things that are limiting the total length of the piece. Mainly, right. right. That's what that's what like cuts it off. Then, yeah. So right. it would go infinitely, except you've got a, a another counter that's saying, "All right, you've done enough." Exactly. Got Notice it. that the master outermost loop of this first part is notes equals zero. Notes is less than the number of measures times the number of beats. So the number of measures is the sum. That's what that sum function was of all of the number of measures there are here. Yeah. Okay. Anthony said he got it. Yeah, he okay. misunderstood it. But he's no got problem. It Yay. All right. Uh, okay, so we now have a beat pattern, which does this pattern over and over again, while we have a measure pattern, which is shifting gradually between, between uh, moving gradually from C to F sharp, F sharp to C. Everything adds up to 12. Bar numbers add up to 12. Uh, so, um, what I want to do is play this first part for you, first of all, just at tempo. Oops. Now what I want to do is slow that down so you can hear exactly what's happening in this accompaniment part. Okay, before the bass came in, you could hear what you heard was two, three, four, but that's because it's uh, two, uh, three, uh, four. There's a rest at the beginning of each of them, so that makes it three, four, five beats, which add up to 12. Okay. Um, let me just say that what this part does is figures out how to play a little two note at a time. Um, pattern from that from that C hexachord. So that's why what you were hearing there slowed down were two notes at a time. And those are randomly chosen from the C hexachord, but without repeats. Then if we play the F sharp hexachord, which happens when we split, instead we have three notes at a time. And the distance to those notes in the room is different. And the strength of those notes is different. Now, why all of this? Because what I'm trying to do is produce the kind of complexity of uh, variables that we get in a real performance, right? So things are louder, things are softer. Sometimes things have more notes, sometimes times they have less. And I haven't even gotten to the fact that these notes are all randomly jittered so that they don't fall directly on the beats. Because again, that's a more human kind of feel. If everything is precisely on the beat, it gets very crisp and very dull. So I do a lot of stuff where I fudge the beat just a hair. All right, so that's the whole part that creates that, that accompaniment. Then we have the part that produces the bass line. Uh, now, in the interest of time, I'll say that what this is doing is playing a single note at a time based upon a new bass pattern, which is five, four, three. So for the accompaniment, we had three, four, five with the rest at the beginning of each one, and the bass plays five, four, three, which means uh, durations of five, four, three. So guess what? They don't, inter they don't overlap, they don't happen at the same times, and they don't even feel like they're in the same meter when you hear them happening at the same time. So that's why you get this feel. All right, 
So that's our bass line. And then lastly, we have a melody. Uh, the melody is completely different. Um, it uses a different instrument. It uses a thing called a wave shape instrument. Um, it also doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, follow any strict set of patterns uh, in terms of its rhythm. It, what it does instead is it randomly plays pitches that I picked here. Pick rand is something Brad showed you. This is basically saying, this is my pitch, one of these. And notice they're all diatonic. But I put in a special thing. If the old pitch, if I've picked that old pitch again, don't, re, don't, don't allow to re, a repeat. Um, the R beats is my, how long my melody note is. And what this weird thing here does is it says, I want you to pick between either having the note be 12 seconds long, or I want it to be the result of this pick rand. So our notes are gonna be three or four, or three or four, or 12. And the reason for that is it's a melody. It's gonna go fast and then it's gonna have long notes. And this is just the way I create, oh, and this is a little function that's built in. I saw Brad was having you do stuff with random, if random is less than six and random is less than nine, all this. There's a function called chance, which you can just say, this means do this thing two out of three times. So you can specify any arbitrary likelihood that you want something to occur um, using that utility. So why do I have this? Because you get a rest in the melody every now and then if you have a two out of three chance that the melody is going to play. Hey, Doug. Yeah. Uh, John Levy's got a, actually a, an interesting question for you. I'm going to let him ask it directly. Because, sure. Uh, yeah. Go for it, John. So I said, uh, could you briefly get into the reason that you choose not to allow repeats anywhere in your music. And I know that you said that earlier they were quote, literally deaf. But <laughs> could you tell us about why you feel that way? Okay, so true literal repeats like loops are deaf because of the, because of information theory. Because um, if you present to, to the human, sensory organs, two things which are absolutely identical, and the only thing that's different is that you're hearing it a second time, the amount of new information that you're providing to the brain is extremely small. And I believe that, my, it is my belief that that, 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 amount of, that that extremely small amount of information is too small for me to be interested in listening to. <laughs> it's, There's an old... There's a Zen saying that if something isn't interesting one time, then try it two times and try it as many times and eventually it will become interesting. So I guess you don't subscribe to that theory. Well, yeah. Like I said, it, it, that's, why I tie, that's why I put at the top of that page, my biases, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I was just wondering about like how you developed your aesthetic, like why you made those choices, just to kind of get a, a, a look into your well, aesthetic as a composer. A, a part of my life I did not talk about is, is that I was part of the early MIDI sequencer software generation. And I used to work professionally in New York City uh, doing MIDI sequences and when you highlight something and say loop it and it just plays it back identically every time, it's, it's just a horrible experience. I mean, so, um, so what I really wanted to do was be able to control, I wanted better control about how, fa how much information you got and how fast you got it. So I can actually vary exactly how much repetition I get in my system and how, and all the way from exact to something where every single moment is unique. So, yeah, there's another aspect too. I mean, first of all, uh, kind of in line with what John's saying, there's a famous um, Brian Eno oblique strategy that says repetition is a form of change. Um, but uh, oh. we'll leave that. I'm going to cast it in more positive terms. So I think uh, it's not that you're necessarily negatively reacting to the direct repetition, but like me, you grew up like listening to progressive rock you know, which was all about kind of density of, you know, 
different musical parameters and things like that. Well, that was me before I got into punk rock, but, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's, that, that was a fundamental part of forming your aesthetic, I think. Yeah, definitely. Okay. What I want to do now is just, uh, before I leave this piece, I just want to play the first 30 seconds or more of it again. Now that you have some sense of how it's put together so that you can be, have a slightly more informed, uh, listening of it. That's that one. Let's see. What was that else? Let's see. Was there anything else I really wanted to talk about about algorithms? Okay. Um, what I think I'll finish up with is, uh, in terms of playing stuff and talking, is sort of the other half of my world, which has to do with um, manipulating recorded um, material and transforming it. So this goes back to what I was telling you about with that Disquiet Junto project. One of the things about Disquiet Junto is they, that their very, very first project they did in January of 2012, which was the year before I started it, was created a project where the instructions are record the sound of ice falling into a glass and do something with it. Every year since then, for the last seven years, the first project of the year in January, that's the project. No other, no other explanation, that same project. I've done about five out of the seven years that that's been the project. So I thought it might be useful to play some things which are all based upon the same idea. And in fact, most of these are all generated with the same original recorded ice sounds that I did for the first piece. So uh, let me switch to that. Can you switch sharing without stopping sharing? I won't. I, I won't think you have stop. to stop it. Uh, hey, okay. Doug, just yeah. to make something clear, um, yeah. pretty much all these pieces are generated from a single score file, correct? Every, the ones that I've played so far, yes, especially the ones where I'm really concentrating on RTC mix algorithms. The pieces that I'm going to talk about now, um, well, the first one is a really great example of one that uses my play now started from about 10 or 12 individual scores, each one which generated a sound file that I wrote out to disk, and then I used those and loaded them into logic. Okay, so that should be that should be relatively clear from sorry, hold on. I'm having a mind glitch for the share. Oh, share screen. That would help. Okay. Logic. Logic, logic, logic. Ah. Here we are. You got that? All right. So I'll play you a little bit at the beginning of this. This is the first piece I did um, for ice sounds back in like 2014 or something like that.
one of the nice things about all of these, <laughs> thanks, Brad. Uh, one of the nice things about these uh, disquiet junto projects is they're almost all supposed to be about three minutes long at the max, and a lot of mine are a lot shorter. So they're great, they're great examples. All right. So um, to the question about motif versus um, gesture, so I, I, in this case, yes, because for example, uh, if I go in here and I solo this and you listen to this little bit right here, okay, so that is um, an example of something that I created using a pretty complex um, script to actually generate just that one file. It's got a lot of stuff going in and on, and it's a lot of repetitions and overlaps and transposition and decay and all that kind of stuff. And it comes back in different forms. Or here. So I was I was being disingenuous. I am very much into motifs. <laughs> um, hey Doug, question yeah. for you. Uh, uh, this is a uh, yeah, it's a it's a good one because it's actually uh, like I use Logic Two to put my pieces together. Um, but the question is, what's your dividing point between using RTC Mix versus Logic? Like, why did you choose Logic to use here? Maybe this is when you got your job at Apple. I don't know. No, no, um, that's a great question. Um, Okay, I know I, 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 uh, that actually plays a lot into my compositional ideas because sometimes I know just what I want. I mean, occasionally I know sort of how a piece is going to be structured, you know, a la, well, I, not, not in terms of quality like Mozart, but, but at least in terms of there being a, a vision of the piece um, such that I can lay out the whole piece within a single score and say, this is the this is the concept of it, right? Actually, that's the good example for the the Bucky Ballet that you heard. I I really knew exactly what that piece was going to do from end to end, how it was going to be changing over the course of it, how and everything. Many 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 of my pieces, I do not conceptualize them from the start. I do not know how that piece is going to go, and really the only way I can find out is by creating material placing it into logic and manipulating it, putting it on top of each other, uh, duplicating it, and really intuitively putting things together. Um, that's why this represents really my alter ego of compositional style, because there is nothing algorithmic about the blocks on the, that you see on this page. The, there is algorithm in every gesture but above that level, I put this together just like I would have put together a piano piece that I noodled at the piano one day and with a pencil and paper and, and so forth. So much of my composition happens at this, this level on these screens for pieces of this type. All right. Um, I think uh, I wanted to get... Let's see if this is close. Don't save. What happened? Did yeah, just to let you know, we got about ten minutes left yeah. before eight o'clock. You can go longer if you want. <laughs> People will have to leave, I think. Yeah, poor Lauren. Her battery's about to run out on her computer. <laughs> got it. Okay, I'm just trying to figure. Oh, screen sharing is stopped. Oh, interesting. Logic only shares the upper window. Um, so I need to go back to here and say, share this. Da -da -da. Okay, here's another piece. I don't think this is the next one in order. Oh yeah, this is it. This is all done with bits of ice.
a little different. Um, making massive use of um, of our uh, time stretching capabilities. Those sounds, that topmost one was stretched, I think, about 300 times longer than it originally was. <laughs> And you'll notice that they're all, um, you can also do individual transposition of those. So they're all tuned in different ways. Hey, Doug, just to make you feel good, uh, you're not seeing it, but uh, several people in the chat window are talking that they really like this music. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, I wanted to try to, f okay, so let me see, close, oops. I wanna see, oh, that's the one I already played. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can find. Oh, okay, I'm running out of time, but I want to play something completely different that's not one of these. I wanted to play you. Oh, I guess I'm going to have to go in and force it open from. I did a piece during the um, uh, during pa the pandemic that I talked to Brad about a lot while I was working on it. Um, so hold on, let me. Oh, let's see. All right. Nine. Uh, The date June 14th, April 16th. Ah, okay. Okay, now let me share this with you quickly. Actually, the longer I talk to you, the less time I'll have to spend at the stupid meeting that one of my colleagues made me start at 5 p.m. It's like, who does meetings at 5 p.m.? All right. That's when you're in the big bucks, Doug. Yeah. Okay. I like color too. So I colorize this one. You have to do this by hand. So um, this piece is also all um, acoustically recorded sounds. And these are all sounds made by objects I found in my kitchen and garage. So I'll play a little bit at the beginning and then I'm gonna skip to the end to my favorite part. So, and oh, this is a piece where I was taking a walk and the opening idea literally came to me like, you know, like the opening of a symphony, so. green moment there is one of my favorite moments in anything I've written in recent times. It's hard for me to explain why. It has to do with things that I heard in, in, um, in the things that I heard in early electronic music that I was like, I wonder how they did that. You know, back in the days when they literally had to splice tiny bits of tape together to produce these really complicated patterns of things that started and stopped and, and, and all that. So, there's a moment here later on in the piece I just I just have to play for you.
I love that. <laughs> um, what happens in that section, this, this is all done with RTC mix algorithms. Um, it's picking randomly between the 25 or 30 um, input files that the rest of the piece is generated with, that, and it chops them up into tiny bits and combines them in all these different ways using all these random selectors for this and that and the other thing. And uh, so, the, so it's a kind of it's a kind of trash bin for everything else that's going on in the piece. They all get thrown in in, in these little bits and pieces at, during those moments. And anyway, like Brad says, I just liked it. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to have to go. Hey, Doug, I got a question from Ben Holtzman. He's uh, listening in. He teaches our data sonification class. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something. When you send me materials to put on the website, uh -huh. um, he was amazed at your 300 times time stretch. And oh. I said, you had to be careful about how you set the PIVO parameters. Could you make sure one of the files that you send the scores is an example of that kind of time stretching? So can you just, can you just email me with what you'd like? And, and then I will, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, what I'm going to try to do is include anything that will play um, without needing any of my sound files. And then I might pick something where you need my sound files to play it, but it's not too hard to drag around. Um, right. I mean, Ben's got plenty of sound files that he can, you know, and no, he knows, I mean, knows RTC mix pretty well. Right. But I mean, he'd have to go in and actually edit the, you know, edit the scores to point at other sound files right. and all that. But yes, be happy to do that. Cool. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure. Make, I, and I know you got to run. Um, uh, well, couple I don't want to of... run. I, I, want to stay, I want to stay right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll start talking real slow. Uh, just a couple of things to let everybody know. Um, this is this is kind of the end of um, uh, looking directly at RTC mix for a while, uh, because uh, well we're still going to be using it, Doug. Don't worry. <laughs> um, next week, owner is going to do uh, starting next week. Owner is going to do a couple of sessions on machine learning, which I think will be really fascinating because it's something I don't even know much about, and I'm really interested in hearing what he has to say. Um, and then we're going to start getting heavily into taking these tools. I, I really wanted you to hear Doug's work because it shows you what's possible within a single score, you know, that you can then put on a server and have work interactively, you know, because we'll start looking at um, different ways of using the web for, you know, creating different kinds of musical scenarios, you know, all different kinds. Lara is going to be talking about her work and she's had a big breakthrough. So I'm anxious to hear what she has to say. Um, and then we've got Miller Puckett and uh, Damon Holtzborn confirmed for November the 18th. They'll be talking about Quack Trip. Um, so yeah, it'll be intriguing how the rest of this goes. And, you know, I'm going to be lecturing on stuff that I don't know how to do yet. <laughs> so that'll be kind of fun. <laughs> I hope the classes go well. Um, I'm going to shut off recording now. And, but before I do, I just want to thank Doug because this was really wonderful. It's exactly what I wanted to have happen. And uh, yeah, all your work, you know, we're, we're, we're standing on your shoulders. So thank you so much. All right. Cool. I just wanted to say one thing, two things quick. One is uh, I, uh, all the stuff I've done with room simulation, um, I stand on the shoulders of Miller Puckett because he was one of the original people to come up with some of these really cool room simulation designs huh. and uh so a combination of him and what uh, Moore did at uc san diego um became the heart of the room simulation stuff that's now built into rtc mix right and that's also we use that quite a bit when we start doing virtual reality work with unity we can i'm sure you know, some of those yeah. things and lastly cool. you know if you like if you like my stuff try the try the website virtually everything i have ever done electronically minus you know something i did when i was 12 is uh is on is on the soundcloud site if you ever want to just come in right. and that's already linked on the web page so you can go there right. and just just go to it yeah so it was my pleasure i really enjoyed it. i've been looking forward to this for weeks I, I, brad will tell you i asked him could i come and talk to your class please please <laughs> oh, i ask you first <laughs> yeah. well i knew what we were going to be covering and i thought you'd be really ideal for it and that turned out to be true so yeah cool. well I, I i look forward to when the when the web page starts coming out with the pieces that you guys have done with links to them i'm I look forward, I always go back and look at what Brad's people are doing. Uh, I look forward to seeing what kind of cool stuff you come up with. All right, cool. All right, everybody. So I'll get the uh, recording of this put on probably by tomorrow. And uh, I'll talk with Doug about getting some of his material up there. Okay, see you all next week. Have a good weekend. Uh, maybe enjoy the debate if you want, but <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. Okay.